Modi takes oaths. Narendra Modi has been sworn in as India's Prime Minister for a third term. French snap election. France's Macron calls snap election in huge gamble after EU polls debacle. Catastrophic failure. Massive landslide wipes out key highway. Jumping for joy. Hundreds of women aged 40 and older gathered to relive their youthful days of jumping rope. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. Good evening and thank you for tuning in tonight on World News. We have lots of fresh updates to bring you and we begin in India. Narendra Modi was sworn in for the third time as the country's Prime Minister on Sunday in a grand ceremony in New Delhi. We begin today in India where Narendra Modi was sworn in for the third time as the country's Prime Minister on Sunday in a grand ceremony in New Delhi. In his speech as he was sworn in by India's President Draupadi Murmu, Modi said he will govern with true faith and allegiance to the constitution and that he will, quote, do right to all manner of people without affection or ill will. Modi took the oath on Sunday along with 72 ministers of the new coalition government. While Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party failed to win an outright majority, his leadership of the National Democratic Alliance coalition government allowed Modi to become only the second prime minister to be elected for a third consecutive term. Thousands of guests, including Bollywood stars, attended the ceremony, as did the seven leaders of seven neighbouring countries. More in France now, Emmanuel Macron announced that he intended to dissolve the parliament and call for a snap parliamentary election. The French president, who has been in power since 2017, said it was time for the country to have its say after his centrist Renaissance party suffered a calamitous result in the EU election. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Chetana Dharmaratne from Paris, France. Yes. President Emmanuel Macron has called snap parliamentary elections later this month in the wake of a big victory of his rival Marine Le Pen's national rally in the European Parliament vote. The far-right party is on course to win 32% of the vote, exit polls say. More than twice that of the president's Renaissance party. Announcing the dissolution of parliament, he said that the two rounds of voting would take place on 30th June and 7th of July a few weeks before the Paris Olympics. People who voted for Lupin's national rally said she was not surprised that the party came first in the votes for the European Parliament because of the problems in the French society. Macron supporters urged fellow citizens to vote for democracy and for France. Analysts said Macron's decision aimed to make the best of his weak position reclaiming the initiative and focusing RN into election mode faster than it would have liked. Back to you. Thank you. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna from Paris, France. And now some updates from the Gaza Health Ministry as they say that the death toll from Israel's hostage rescue operation in Gaza killed at least 274 Palestinians, including women and children. Israeli centrist Minister Benny Gantz announced his resignation from Benjamin Netanyahu war cabinet citing the Prime Minister's mismanagement of the war. On Saturday, the Israeli military rescued four hostages from the Gaza's Al-Nusayrat camp, which, according to the Gaza Health Ministry, killed at least 274 Palestinians, including 57 women and 64 children, while wounding at least another 600. The death toll is the highest reported in a 24-hour period since the outbreak of the war in Gaza. Israel Defense Forces Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari said the latest operation had been planned for weeks, with the unusual daytime raid intended to create a greater element of surprise, despite the greater associated risks. The Israeli military said that a special forces officer was killed during an exchange of fire. 
According to Hamas, three other hostages, including one with U.S. citizenship, were also killed in the raid. Meanwhile, on Sunday, Israeli Minister Benny Gantz announced his resignation from Israel's three-man emergency war cabinet. Last month, Gantz had set a June 8 deadline to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to come up with a clear post-war strategy, which the Prime Minister had brushed off. And following the rescue operation on Saturday, Gantz delayed his decision by just a day. Unfortunately, Netanyahu prevents us from progressing to the real victory, which is the justification for the painful and ongoing price. That is why we are leaving the wartime cabinet today with a heavy heart, but with a whole heart. While Gantz's departure would not pose an immediate threat to the Israeli government, it may leave Netanyahu more reliant on his far-right coalition, who stand against the latest U.S.-backed ceasefire proposal. This suggests there's no end in sight for the ongoing Gaza war, which has killed over 36,700 Palestinians. In the first five months of this year, exports to the U.S. surpassed those to China. If that trend continues, annual exports to the U.S. could exceed those to China for the first time in 22 years. From January to May this year, South Korea's total exports to the United States exceeded its exports to China. According to the Trade Ministry on Monday, if this trend continues in the second half of the year, annual shipments to the states could surpass those to China for the first time since 2002. Between January and May, South Korea's exports to the U.S. totaled 53.3 billion U.S. dollars, which is $610 million more than the $52.7 billion of exports to China. Across the whole of last year, exports to the U.S. were $115.7 billion, which was $9.1 billion less than exports to China. However, since 2016, exports to the U.S. have been steadily increasing, driven by sales of cars and batteries. They surpassed $100 billion for the first time in 2022 and reached a record high last year. For large companies, exports to the U.S. last year reached $79.5 billion, surpassing their exports to China for the first time in 20 years thanks to increased sales of eco-friendly cars, SUVs and machineries. Small and medium-sized companies are also like to export more to the U.S. than to China this year, driven by a surge in cosmetics and machinery exports. In contrast, exports to China have been falling since 2021. They hit a record high of $162.9 billion in 2021, but due to the slowdown in Chinese manufacturing, they fell to $124.8 billion last year. However, the situation could change as the Chinese economy is slowly starting to recover. Recently, the International Credit Rating Agency Moody's raised its forecast for China's economic growth rates this year from 4% to 4.5%. In April, the Bank of Korea predicted that exports to the US would continue to boost the Korean economy, supported by increased investment by Korean companies in the US and sustained US consumer demand. A landslide has caused the roadway at Teton Pass in Wyoming to collapse and crumble in what Wyoming Department of Transportation officials are calling a catastrophic failure. An emergency declaration after a mountain road near the popular Jackson, Wyoming tourist destination catastrophically failed. Drone video showing the massive chunk of the Teton Pass that plunged 70 feet down the mountain. This 8-inch crack started forming Thursday. By Friday, an additional 10 to 12 inches rapidly formed. This road connects Jackson to towns in East Idaho. 10,000 vehicles pass through each day, including families who commute to work and school. 40% of Teton County's workforce comes from Idaho to support popular tourist attractions like Grand Teton National Park, Yellowstone, and luxury resorts. Crews working to revive a vital transportation lifeline destroyed by Mother Nature. Belgian Prime Minister Alexander de Croo announced his resignation after the defeat of his Flemish Liberals and Democrats party in the European elections. Belgian Prime Minister Alexander de Croo has suffered a crushing defeat in the country's general elections with his Liberal Open VLD party managing less than 7% of the vote. 
Despite polls predicting that the far-right anti-immigration Flams Belang party would become the main political force, the right-wing nationalist New Flemish Alliance retained first place with an expected 22%. Flams Belang came in second, taking 17.5% of the vote. Sunday's results will result in complex negotiations to form coalitions in a country divided by language and deep regional identities. Flams Belang has so far been blocked from entering governments as mainstream parties vow to exclude it from power under a cordon sanitaire doctrine. That refers to the protective barrier put in place to stop the spread of infectious diseases. Let's take a short commercial break, more world news on the other side. Welcome back. South Korea resumed loudspeaker broadcast against North Korea after Pyongyang sent more balloons carrying trash into the south. South Korean military said it resumed loudspeaker broadcasts directed at North Korea on Sunday after Pyongyang sent more balloons carrying trash into the south. In a video provided by the military on Sunday, trucks were shown carrying loudspeakers and soldiers assembling them in a training exercise. The military said it was the first such training since 2018. The location and date of the training were not disclosed. The decision to resume the broadcasts as a form of psychological warfare was made after North Korea began launching about 330 balloons with trash attached a day before, with about 80 of them dropping over the border. That's according to South Korea's military. South Korea's broadcasts include world news and information about democratic and capitalist society, with a mix of popular K-pop music. The sound is believed to travel more than 12 miles into North Korea. Pyongyang started sending balloons carrying trash and manure across the border in May. It has said the move was in retaliation for anti-North leaflets flown by South Korean activists as part of a propaganda campaign. North Korea has shown some of the angriest reactions towards the leaflet campaign and the loudspeaker broadcasts, in some cases firing weapons at the balloons and speakers. South Korea stopped the broadcasts under an agreement signed by the two Korea's leaders in 2018, but tensions have mounted since then as Pyongyang pushed ahead with weapons development. On the road to the White House tonight, Donald Trump held his first campaign rally since his conviction on Sunday. His speech to a sweltering crowd of thousands in Las Vegas comes as he vows revenge against his perceived political enemies. Tonight, former President Trump turning the campaign trail into a defiance tour. Oh, for Trump, we want a felon. On his first campaign swing, since his guilty verdict for falsifying business records. The people are watching and they know a fake deal. Speaking to a crowd of several thousand in 100 degree heat under the scorching Las Vegas sun, the former president's rally coming under the shade of legal setbacks. The former president is now scheduled for a virtual sit down interview with the New York City probation officer. A key first step for his sentencing and potential jail time. The officer will evaluate Trump's level of remorse, his financial background and mental state and provide a report to the judge to help him determine the sentence that he will hand down to Trump on July 11th. They've weaponized the Department of Justice like has never happened in this country. Trump publicly showing no regrets. And over the last week, he's repeatedly equivocated on whether he'd seek revenge against his perceived political enemies. Based on what they've done, I would have every right to go after them. It's a terrible, terrible uh, path that they're leading us to. And it's very possible that it's going to have to happen to them. Just this week, he called for the indictment of the members of Congress who worked on the January 6th Select Committee. And over the last year, he has called for the indictment of District Attorney Alvin Bragg, who oversaw his New York prosecution. U.S. Supreme Court justices disclosed receiving gifts like a stay in Bali Hotel and tickets to a Beyoncé concert alongside almost $1.6 million in book advances and royalties in their 2023 financial disclosure forms. 
U.S. Supreme Court justices reported receiving gifts in annual financial disclosure forms for 2023, released on Friday. It includes a stay in a Bali hotel and tickets to a Beyoncé concert, as well as nearly $1.6 million in book advances and royalties. Conservative Justice Clarence Thomas has come under criticism for failing to disclose gifts from businessman and Republican donor Harlan Crow. Thomas revised his 2019 form to acknowledge he accepted food and lodging at a Bali hotel and at a California club. Liberal Justice Katanji Brown-Jackson said she received four concert tickets from music superstar Beyoncé valued at over $3,700. And Conservative Justice Samuel Alito got a 90-day extension on his filing. He has been under fire for reports of flags associated with Donald Trump's attempts to overturn his 2020 election defeat, flying outside his home. The filings showed the justices' outside income, gifts and investment transactions last year. They are closely watched as the justices have faced increasing scrutiny over ethics following revelations that some of them fail to report luxury trips, including on private jets and real estate transactions. The disclosures show the lucrative nature of book publishing for members of the nation's highest judicial body. The advance for Jackson's memoir, Lovely One, was reported as $893,750 while Conservative Justice Brett Kavanaugh listed book royalty income as $340,000. Under pressure from the drumbeat of criticism over ethical standards, the justices in November adopted their first code of conduct. Critics and some congressional Democrats have said the ethics code does not go far enough to promote transparency, continuing to leave decisions to recuse from cases to the justices themselves and providing no mechanism of enforcement. In a groundbreaking display, Rio's Christ the Redeemer statue wore a traditional Korean handball for the first time via beam projection. This celebrated the Light of Korea exhibition opening and anticipated the G20 summit in Brazil. The iconic landmark of Brazil's Rio de Janeiro, the statue of Christ the Redeemer, is clad in traditional Korean hanbok clothing. The hanbok was being projected onto the statue in what was the first time it has been dressed in the traditional clothing of another country. The event was to celebrate the opening of the Lights of Korea exhibition, which began at Rio's Museum of Contemporary Art from Sunday and the G20 summit set to take place in Brazil in November. The Christ the Redeemer Sanctuary stated that the projected hanbok chosen by South Korean designer Jin Hee Lee represents a union between Korea and Brazil, while the garment's belt featured the colors of the G20 logo. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. Double Dutch jump rope took off in the US in the 1940s and 1950s. One group is keeping the tradition alive for people 40 and older, and the organization is only growing. Mastering the fast-paced footwork between two ropes comes naturally for these women, who've been captivating crowds through Double Dutch. And what might be even more impressive, everyone you see is at least 40 years old. 53-year-old Pamela Robinson of Chicago started the 40-plus Double Dutch Club in 2016. The 40-plus Double Dutch Club. Interest and membership grew after they appeared on a local television station in 2019. The only cost, a $25 t-shirt that proudly displays your name and age. Get him, Shirley. Shirley Wilford hey. is 88. It's a movement on a mission to promote friendship, fitness, fun, and fellowship. Well, that is all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune in again tomorrow for more key updates from across the globe. 
Stay tuned as I will be back in just a moment with the Nile Business Report. Thank you for watching and good night.